Educational Communications and this station present Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman. On this series, we explore the effects of human influence on the Earth's ecosystems and discuss solutions to environmental problems which affect the quality of life on this planet. Environmental Directions gives you the kind of information you need to help you participate in decisions impacting your community, the nation, and the world. Now, here's your host, Nancy Perlman. Hello, we're going to be talking about air pollution and science with my guest, Dr. James Instrom. He is a retired University of California at Los Angeles research professor of epidemiology. He is president of the Scientific Integrity Institute in Los Angeles. He is a founding fellow of the American College of Epidemiology. And for the past 20 years, he has been working on air pollution, regulations, and the impact of studies that relate to those regulations. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity. You have done a bit of research and analysis regarding PM 2.5 and whether or not the regulations are adequate from the studies regarding that pollutant. What exactly is it? PM 2.5 stands for particulate matter that is 2.5 microns or less in diameter. That is approximately one thirtieth the diameter of a human hair, and it's virtually invisible to the human eye. It's part of what is total particulate matter. This is fine particulate matter versus coarse particulate matter, which is particulate matter larger than 2.5 microns in diameter. Particulate matter is most evident in forest fires that many of which have occurred here in California in the last few years and in dust storms, especially occur in farming areas. The definition is used because the health effects associated with fine particulate matter seem to be more evident than for particulate matter as a whole. Particulate matter can incorporate many different kinds of pollutants. For example, soot, which is unburned carbon, is just one of those components. What are the other ones? Fine particulate matter, in addition to coming from forest fires and dust storms, comes from other sources of burning, like in fireplaces, wood burning, or from engines. Diesel engines in particular emit fine particulate matter. These are different sources that contribute to the substance being in the air. These are quite small in terms of the amount that's inhaled by a human on a typical day. It's uh, about 100 micrograms of fine particulate matter that's inhaled by a human on a individual day. So these are trace amounts, but they have been associated with a lot of health effects. Obviously, pollutants in the air have caused many, many health problems and other kinds of environmental problems. We have to have scientists do studies to determine how much is okay, how much isn't, in order to regulate what is put out in the air. But you maintain that depending on the data that is used, you'll get different results. So how does that happen? Well, this is a recurring issue that has happened in a lot of areas, especially in environmental science, where different scientists have different ways of collecting and analyzing and interpreting data. This is especially important issue here in Southern California because Los Angeles in the middle of the 20th century was one of the smoggiest and most polluted cities in the United States. Oh, I remember driving up to Los Angeles as a child and saw the black smog layer when I went from Orange County to Los Angeles County. It was severe. Yes, and so this is when regulatory agencies began to be formed. There was an air pollution control agency established here in Southern California, and that became the California Air Resources Board in 1967. 
And then in 1976, there's the South Coast Air Quality Management District where it was established. These were all agencies designed to reduce the level of air pollution. And SMOG is the uh, acronym that's most commonly used to describe it. Particulate matter and ozone are probably the two most well-known components in air pollution. In fact, that term smog was defined by a professor at Caltech in Pasadena, defined what smog was. And obviously, the regulations that were established have been very helpful in cleaning up the air. I can actually see some blue sky now. The regulations have caused fewer deaths and fewer health problems among people and the various impacts on our plant and animal life. Yet, you maintain that some of the standards used by regulators saying that PM 2.5 from combustion causes premature deaths is not always accurate? How can you tell that? There's no doubt that heavy levels of smog coming especially from particulate matter cause respiratory problems. The major dispute is over whether they actually cause death. That's a big difference between uh, having a breathing problem and dying of this problem. And so it comes back to the profession that I've been involved in for the last half century, uh, epidemiology, and how you associate exposures to air pollution with long-term outcomes, including death. So the major controversy lies over how to interpret the evidence that there is an association between air pollution, particularly particulate matter, and death. That's where we have scientific controversy, and this is a very important issue to resolve because the way that a lot of the regulations that come from the agencies that I just mentioned are justified is because they assign a value typically uh, nine or ten million dollars for every life lost by fine particulate matter if there are actually deaths due to this and then that gives a benefit of regulations which are extremely costly to impose on businesses in uh, california and so we've now gotten to the point where the air is quite clean. It's never been cleaner than it is now. And you and I are examples of people who have been in California and watched this improvement. The question is, are we now at a point where the regulations are more costly than the benefits of imposing the regulations. I suppose that that's where we may have a slight disagreement because I believe that we still have pollution. We still need regulations. What they should be and are is something that, of course, has to be decided on the scientific data. But you don't seem to think that we should ban leaf blowers because of emissions or that we should ban wood burning stoves or fireplaces? Well, because these are sources that are actually uh, quite small. When you look at the big picture, what I mean by the big picture is looking at air pollution around the world and looking at the other factors that determine the way people live and function. We're in a worldwide economy now, and we compete against countries like China and India in terms of the intellectual and manufacturing resources, everything has to be kept in perspective. And so in terms of actual levels that exist based on now with satellites, you can measure precisely the air pollution levels all over the world. And the United States has among the lowest of any country in the world these levels. And these numbers may not be as easy to understand, but in relative terms, you can. In the United States, the level averages about seven micrograms per cubic meter in the United States. This compares to about 50 
micrograms per cubic meter. In China, overall, the levels in industrial cities in China are much higher than 50. And the levels in India and Africa are higher than the levels in China. We're talking about major differences where California and the United States are at the very low end. But I'm proud of the United States having cleaned up our air pollution to a better degree than China. When I visited China and went into the factories, I saw water pollution, air pollution, horrible working conditions. I saw cities with smog. I don't think that they are a good model for us. And we know that even for the recent anniversary in China, they've seeded the clouds to clean up the air to make it look like they're doing well. And yet they aren't. Yes, the problem is China is a competitor nation to the United States, and as all of us know, we buy a lot of goods that are manufactured in China. Many of these goods used to be manufactured in Southern California. They're no longer viable in Southern California because regulations are so extreme that there's no way to compete with the Chinese on these products. There used to be tremendous production of automobiles, production of tires, production of aerospace in Southern California. And all of these things have moved elsewhere for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is the regulatory policy that's been adopted. But wouldn't one possible solution be not to import these products if they are produced in a polluting, unecological, unsustainable manner? Yes, that's true, but then Americans would have to pay more. This is a question. The Americans are buying these goods. They can buy American-made products, but they're more expensive. Are we not paying more in terms of our health? We have to consider all the factors if we allow pollution, we are going to be impacted. Our health is going to be impacted. Our health care system, we have to pay to take care of people who are getting sick from pollution. This goes back to my profession of epidemiology. This issue is taken in isolation. They just look at an association between air pollution and health, and they don't look at the overall factors. And most people don't realize because of the constant focus on health problems that California, even better in Southern California, has the lowest age-adjusted death rate from all causes in the United States. These are tremendous differences that reflect a number of things that Californians are doing right. Californians are much more health conscious than residents in other states. It's just a different kind of lifestyle. Let's talk a little bit more about air quality and air pollution and all these factors when we return in a moment with my guest, Dr. James Enstrom. Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman continues with further discussion of the world's critical ecological issues. For more information, you may call 310-559-9160 or go to www.ecoprojects.org. Now, here's Nancy. I'm speaking with Dr. James Imstrom. He is a retired UCLA research professor of epidemiology and president of the Scientific Integrity Institute. You were talking about how California versus other places in the country deal with air quality, pollution. What is the difference between the regulations on a regional level? You mentioned the South Coast Air Quality Management District versus the federal level, like the Environmental Protection Agency because there are groups like KSAC, the Federal Advisory Committee to EPA on Air Quality. There are other federal agencies dealing with pollution. What's the difference in terms of who regulates what? This is actually very timely because I just submitted public comments to the KSAC, that's the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee of EPA, regarding their assessment of the standard for fine particulate matter, which is under review right now. The basic rules on air pollution come from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, which was established in 1970. They're followed by the entire country, 
except California has a, a waiver because their agency, the California Air Resources Board, was established in 1967, at that point had the worst air pollution in the United States. So they were granted an ability to have more restrictive regulations than the United States as a whole. And so traditionally, the regulations in California have been more restrictive than the nationally. And this is an issue which has led to the very tough regulations that we have here in California. A number of us are contesting whether we're now, because of the cleanup that's been done over the last half century, there needs to be more balance in terms of the impact that this is having on other aspects of society. What is your stance on the Environmental Protection Agency's rule on strengthening transparency in regulatory science? That sounds very important. Absolutely. Science is based on the scientific method where you develop a hypothesis and then you try and test the hypothesis and then you try to repeat the tests over and over and see if you come up with a consistent answer. Now, the problem with epidemiology is because you're dealing with human beings in these studies, you can't actually do the same kind of experimental tests that you do in hard sciences like physics and chemistry where you can do a controlled experiment and not worry about whether you're affecting humans. In other words, you can't do an experiment on humans that might result in their harm or death. And epidemiology is basically an observational science where you just observe humans over time. This results when effects are weak, then it's difficult to interpret whether these changes are actually caused by something like air pollution or they're just associated with air pollution. This is a, an ongoing controversy, but one way that you can get at this is if a set of scientists produce a result using a certain set of data, then another group of scientists should be able to check to see that they come up with the same result. This is transparency. This goes to transparency and reproducibility. And this has been an issue that has plagued especially the PM 2.5 regulations since the major papers came out in 1993 and 1995. The reason that I'm important in this is because my career in epidemiology was made possible by the American Cancer Society. And they actually gave me funding in 1973 that started my career. And I've had funding from them over the next 20 years. And yet you're against their 1982 study on cancer prevention by the Cancer Society. Why? They developed a nationwide survey called the Cancer Prevention Study 2, because it was the second one they started in 1982, and they enrolled over a million Americans all over the country. And I was involved in enrolling subjects. I enrolled subjects here in Southern California. This data has been used as the primary basis for establishing PM 2.5 standard in 1997 because of a paper that was published in 1995 by investigators from the American Cancer Society and elsewhere. But the point is the American Cancer Society never allowed independent analysis of this other than by the group that did the original analysis. And so I was able to get access to this data five years ago and I published data in 2017, findings that showed the original 1995 findings were not as accurate as they claimed. You could find that if you did the, the analysis I did, you don't get a relationship that's significant between fine particulate matter and total mortality. As you indicate, science is based on studies and theories and being proved and restudied by others and it's changeable depending on the new data and how the studies are conducted and of course the scientific data is used in regulatory agencies to set regulations also in lawsuits what's this young versus epa lawsuit about this is a lawsuit that is based on the fact that there are particular ways in which panels are put together for assessing evidence, and it's called the Federal Advisory Committee Act. 
and these committees are supposed to have balanced viewpoints. Uh, in other words, a spectrum of viewpoints by the scientists that are on the committee. So the basis of this lawsuit is that the committee that I have spoken to now three times during the last month, these are webcast proceedings, but the point is the committee that's now doing the assessment, it's called the Particulate Matter Panel, consists of 22 scientists who already have published and made clear that they think the regulations need to be tightened. In other words, this is not balanced with any scientist like myself. That's the basis of the lawsuit, that the committee is not presenting a fair and balanced assessment of this issue. We certainly need fair and balanced assessment of the critical environmental issues. I am concerned about science being used effectively and properly. You're president of the Scientific Integrity Institute here in Los Angeles. What do you mean by scientific integrity? Because I'm concerned about scientists who are paid by big polluting companies like oil companies who for many decades were saying that we didn't have a climate change problem. And of course, internationally, scientists all over the world, countries all over the world have all agreed that we have a massive problem and that we do have climate change and that humans are a major cause of of what's causing the climate change. I always thought it was not good that people were being paid off to say otherwise. That's an important issue. The reason this becomes a problem is because, again, you have to interpret whether you are actually assessing evidence based on honest analysis or whether you are judging the scientists on the basis of factors other than the actual science, factors like the source of their funding. These are important aspects to assess, but you have to actually, in the end, you have to rely on how honest the findings are that the scientists are coming up with. And so the problem is that agencies like the EPA do not fund scientists like myself. No matter how good my ideas are, they know that I am a skeptic. And so that's one reason I've never received any funding from EPA. In order to conduct research, you have to find funding somehow. And I've found funding from many, many different sources. Like I said, my career was started by the American Cancer Society, although they would not fund me now because they don't like my conclusions. But my conclusions, the way you judge a scientist is if their findings hold up over time and are shown by repeated measurements by others to be accurate. In my career, when I published my first scientific paper in 1967, all the findings that I published have stood up. We've talked about some of the past studies that have been conducted regarding air pollution and how they influence the regulatory standards. Do we need more studies and what would we need to study and what kind of regulations do we need at this point? I believe that we need objective assessment of what's been done so far far. And this is, again, hard to do because the regulatory agencies are still interested in doing more regulation. But I believe that there's enough evidence out there. It just is not used. In fact, this is what the comments that I've just made to the um, EPA on something they call the integrated science assessment. They basically focused on studies that show adverse health effects of PM 2.5 and they just basically ignore. They do not cite my work at all. As far as EPA goes, I do not exist. Now that's wrong for a scientist that has accomplished as much as I have over half a century. For me just to be totally ignored as if I don't exist, that's not the way to do science. And this is, I'm not the only one. I compiled 61 scientists from not only the United States, but there are also scientists from Europe, 
that have contested what EPA is doing. Essentially, none of these scientists are cited in their integrated science assessment or their policy assessment. This is not right. Is the United States taking the lead in doing scientific studies on air quality and air pollution, or are the European scientists doing a better job, or are there scientists in other parts of the world that are doing important studies? Oh, yes, absolutely. One of the most aggressive group of scientists actually is our northern neighbor country of Canada. They have been extremely aggressive. There are a lot of European scientists that are working on this. What's really missing are the scientists in the countries where the levels of air pollution are high, and that is China, India, and Africa. We do have a lot of science, but a lot of the way this science is done and interpreted is not objective based on my assessment and the say the assessment of over 60 scientists that I can cite, most of whom you've not ever heard of because they're basically ignored. So that's why I'm so proud of you at least asking me to be interviewed. Thank you. Based on your studies, based on your analysis and work in this area for many decades, what new laws or regulations would help us get to a higher level of clean air? Because that, I think we all agree on, that we want. Well, again, this is where you have to balance it with the impact that it's having overall. What is your position regarding the backlog of trucks at our port and the diesel regulations? And there's a very good example, which has just come up in the last two months. There was a letter that was put together October 19th that was sent to the governor. It was assembled primarily by the California Business Roundtable in Sacramento and the Los Angeles Business Federation here in Los Angeles County, pointing out ways in which the supply chain crisis that we're having at the port could be alleviated. And two of their major points were suspending regulations from the California Air Resources Board and the South Coast Air Quality Management District, because these regulations are limiting the number of trucks and the kind of truck that can pick up the goods that are coming in from the ships. It's gotten so extreme that we have a lot of trucks that are perfectly operating perfectly well. They're just not allowed to pick up goods because supposedly their emissions are too great and they pose a health danger. And I'm saying that this health danger doesn't really exist. This is where you have a a problem right now that's impacting virtually everyone to varying degrees in the country because uh, the goods movement is being blocked at these two ports. So in any case, you could get the perspective of these organizations. It includes organizations like the California Retailers Association, the California Trucking Association, the Western Growers Association, the uh, Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce. We know that emissions come from two major areas, transportation, cars, vehicles, trucks, and stationary factories. Do you think it's a good idea to go for all electric vehicles? Not if they're done in a violation of basic scientific principles. Electricity comes from, in many cases, burning of coal and from other what are called polluting sources. And so if these vehicles need to be charged by electric electricity, which they have to be, then the, the rush to electric vehicles is out of bounds in terms of the impact it's going to have on society. But the diesel truck issue comes up because diesel particulate matter is one source of fine particulate matter. And the point is, that's where I have contested what the California Air Resources Board and the South Quality Air Quality Management District have done because they're exaggerating the health issues and they're not keeping the perspective where it's disrupting, in this particular case, the supply chain. It's wonderful that you have worked in this field and provided some scientific studies and that you do provide an important opinion and important position so that 
we can improve our environmental conditions. I'd like to thank you so very much for your work in this area, and thank you for being my guest. Well, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity. I have been speaking with Dr. James Enstrom, who is a retired University of California, Los Angeles research professor of epidemiology. I'm Nancy Perlman. Thank you very much for joining us, and do tune in again next week. If you would like free information about these environmental issues, go to www.ecoprojects.org or call 310-559-9160. Environmental Directions with your host, Nancy Perlman, is a community affairs program of the nonprofit organization Educational Communications and this station.